And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, from, for I have provided me a king among his sons. I want you to highlight the word provided. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. I want you to highlight the word name. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all of your children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him. For we will not sit down till he comes hither. Oh, have mercy. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. I want to live for a subject this morning. When God has your name on a blessing. When God has your name on a blessing, I want to speak to you from this subject matter and I want you to highlight for a, a series theme, Episodes in the Life of David. What we're going to do, church, is we're going to study the life of David. He is one of the prominent people of the Old Testament and he is certainly one of God's prophets and you'll find in the New Testament David is frequently quoted even in Acts chapter 2. You remember that he's identified as one of God's prophets. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 30, therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath that of the fruit of his loins he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. David was, of course, one of the individuals in the seed promise, which means that it was through David that would come forth the Messiah. The Jews highly exalted David and believed that he was God's special king, and he certainly was. As a matter of fact, the Bible identifies him as a man after God's own heart. Understand that we see David as a king, and many of us uh, uh, celebrate David's kingship. Certainly, he was a great king that ruled during the United Kingdom, which means this is prior to Israel splitting into northern and southern kingdoms. David was a great king. David had his issues, but he was, in fact, a great king. But I want to suggest to you that I don't want to highlight so much him being king, but I want to look at his process to becoming a king. Sometimes we see people who have reached a level of success and we get very excited about their arrival, but what we don't see is they had to go through something before they got there. 
And I want to suggest to you today that everybody has a destination. God has a destination for your life. And many times we need to understand we see people as the finished product. And many times we see people who have been successful and who have uh, achieved great goals. But what we don't pay attention sometimes to is the process that they had to go through in order to get there. Some of us want micro, well, microwave success. We want overnight prominence. We don't want to go through nothing to get nothing. We just want to get everything uh, easily. We don't want to work for nothing. We just want God to lay it in our lap. But I've come today to tell you greatness comes with the price. And you've got to understand sometimes God will send you through some stuff before you reach your destination because God wants to teach you some things along the journey. God has a destination for you, but I want to suggest to you that there is a process. Before David had prominence, he went through a process. And before the process, he had the potential. But understand, God will put potential in you, but you've got to understand potential alone does not allow you to reach a level of success or greatness in your life. Understand potential has to be exercised, and with the potential, there's a process before you'll ever reach your prominence. Understand David is king, church, but let's look at what David had to go through before he ever became a king. And the first thing I want you to see and be confident about is before David ever came into being king, God already had his name on that blessing. It didn't matter who tried to take it from him. It didn't matter what he went through. God had his hand on David and nobody was going to take what God had for him. And I want to suggest to you today that if you are in fact a child of God, you need to understand that God's got a destination for you. And no devil in hell can steal your blessing. What God has for you is what God has for you. It doesn't matter how many enemies you may have who might talk about you, who may try to sabotage you. If God put my name on that blessing. That blessing is mine and mine only. I ain't got to worry about who's trying to take it. I don't have to worry about who's trying to sabotage me. I'm just going to keep my hand in God's hand and I know that God's going to keep my name on that blessing. And when you try to take it, God's going to say, that don't belong to you. That belongs to my servant. And I want you to know God knows how to bring you to the destination and you got to have enough confidence to know that no matter who doesn't think you're worth it, no matter who doesn't think you should have it, no matter who don't think you should, you deserve it, you've got to have in your mind that I serve a God that knows how to bring me to my destination. And if God put my name on that blessing, no devil in hell can take it from me. Are y'all following me on this morning? I want somebody to know that God's got a destination for you. And God wants to bring you someplace. And you've got to know that God got his name on a blessing. It's yours. It's yours. And you've got to have enough confidence to know that God wants me to reach my goals. He wants me to be successful. He wants me to be the kind of person that overcomes. And many times in the body of Christ, we are people that are so defeated. Mm. We're so defeated. We, are, we, we come in with our heads down. We can't even give God no worship and no praise because we don't understand God put greatness inside of me. God put the potential of greatness inside of you. God doesn't mean you to live beneath your privileges. God wants you to know that you're my child. And if you're my child, God has a destination for you. And you've got to know you'll reach it if you keep your hand in God's hand. I want you to see that David is, is, is going to become king. But before he becomes king, he's got to go through a process. Uh, he goes from a kid to being the king. But before he ever became king, he had to learn some trials while he was a kid. <laughs> and I want you to understand on the day that when you reach your destination, when you get there, you're going to know it was God that brought you through. Uh, because God works on you through the process. Don't despise the process. Enjoy the process. It's not always what you want it to be. But understand it's in the process that God builds you and develops you. Before you come into your kingdom, no, God has got to take you through some things. In the book of Samuel, those of you who are familiar with this book, it is a historical book that's named after one of its writers, Samuel. Samuel is the one who climaxes the period of the judges. And he will transition uh, Israel into having a king. You remember in 1 Samuel chapter 8 that Israel said, I want a king just like the other nations. It's dangerous when you want to be like the other nations. Praise God, that's another sermon. But you have to understand he transitions them into the kingship. That is, Israel wants a king like other nations. They end up anointing Saul. But Saul started out good, but he ended up declining. He, he started being disobedient to God. He was self-centered. He was all about himself. He was arrogant. And that began to manifest. And God eventually 
eventually rejects Samuel from being king. When he rejects Samuel from being king, he then sought for a king that would have the kind of heart that he was looking for. And God told Samuel, or rather told Saul very clearly, I have rejected you and I'm going to replace you with somebody else. Never think that you're so important that God can't replace you. I just That's not my sermon either. But don't get beside yourself and start thinking that you're more than what you think you are. Let me just give you a reality check that God knows how to reject and replace. <laughs> I said he knows how to reject and replace and I can never get so arrogant that I think everything's about me and forget about the God who brought me where I am because the same God that brought you to the mountaintop will knock you off of your high horse, put you on your back, make you look up and realize it was me that brought you where you are and the same God that giveth is the same God that can take away. You've got to understand God knows how to reject and he knows how to replace and Saul was being replaced and God began to seek for another king. In 1 Samuel 16, in verse number 1, I told you to highlight that verse. In verse number 1, he says, Samuel, why are you still mourning? Because it's time for you to get up. For I have provided myself a king. <laughs> I, I have provided myself a king. I want you to see the providing in this choosing. Understand that God said, I have provided myself a king. Now I want you to see the blessing in this is because God saw David as a king before David ever knew he was a king. Which means God was able to see something in David that David didn't even see in himself at this point. God could see something in David that his daddy couldn't see. He could see something in David that even Samuel couldn't see. The word provide literally means to see. That means God, but not only did God see, but God saw before. Which means God saw what David could be, and God saw his potential before David ever became a king. I want you to understand that God, when he sees you, sees your potential. I want you to understand when God sees you, he can see your value in when you don't even see your own value. God can see in you what nobody else wants to see. And I'm glad that I don't have to let nobody define who I am, and I don't have to let nobody tell me what my value is, because God can see in me what you don't want to see in me, and God can see something in me that nobody else wants to see because God can see a diamond in the rough. You see rough but God says I see a diamond because he can see what I'm going to be when you only see where I am. And the problem is many people define you by where you are. But what you all understand is where I am is not where I'm going to stay. And God knows how to develop you beyond where you are. And some people come to conclusions based on where you are, but you've got to understand God is still working on me, and he can see the end from the beginning, so God can see in me what nobody else wants to see in me. I have provided me a king. I see in David kingship, even though David is not yet a king. Oh, sirs, I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but I want you to understand God's got a destination for your life. And understand the first thing you got to understand about God when he blesses you, he blesses you before you even know you're going to be blessed. There's some blessings you're going to come into that you don't even understand how you got these blessings. Is that God already planned for you to be blessed. And if I keep my hand in God's hand, I know that God's going to bring me where I need to be. And he said, I've provided a king, Samuel. I've already seen my king before my king knows he's a king. Church people will come to conclusions about your value. And they begin to judge you based on things you may have gone through. And they stop seeing value in you, but I'm glad God can see what nobody else can. And I serve a God that can see me where I am, but he also knows where I'm going. And so God provides. He sees a king prior to David becoming one. I've got it all says. I am of the mindset that there are something God wants me to be that I haven't gotten yet. Oh, I am not a finished product. I am not where I want to be, but I'm not where I was. God's got me in a process, and if I left it to other folk, I would have thought I had no value. If I left it to other folk, they would have said I was a nobody. If I left it to other folk, they would have said I'm going nowhere. But God said, I see something in you before you ever saw it in yourself, and I see what you could be even when nobody else can see nothing positive. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Oh, listen. He said, I've provided for me 
a king. Samuel said, okay. And he says, all right, Samuel, I want you to go down to Bethlehem. And he says, well, Lord, I'm going down there, but you got to understand, I have to go through Gibeah first. And that's where Saul is. If Saul finds out that I'm going, he's going to kill me. Because ain't no way Saul is going to be the kind of person that wants to be replaced by another king. So he says, you got to understand, I'm finna get killed if I go that way. He said, well, tell him, uh, make sure you take a sacrifice. So not only are you going to anoint a king, but you can now say you're going to make sacrifice. And he says, I want you to go down to the city of Bethel. I don't only want you to see <laughs> that God provided a king. He could see it before he did it. But I want you to see where his king would come from. Bethel was a village of insignificance. Bethel was a place where nobody saw anything great. Bethel was five miles off from Jerusalem. It was considered a small, insignificant place of which no greatness was going to come out of that place. Bethel was the place where nobody saw anything awesome coming from Bethel. It was small. It was insignificant. But God said, that's where I'm going to find my king. Oh, I said, God said, that's where I'm going to find my king. I'm going to find him in the place of insignificance. And I have come today to tell you, there are folk that have looked at my life and your life and said, you ain't nothing better than Bethel. You are insignificant. There's nothing great that's going to come out of your life. But I've come today to tell you, great things came out of Bethel. I found that Rachel gave birth to Benjamin, which gave Israel their first king. And that happened in Bethlehem. I want you to understand clearly that Ruth met Boaz and that happened in in the place called Bethel. I want you to know that the Savior was born in the city of Bethlehem. That is somebody great was going to come out of Bethlehem. God fixed it where my Savior would come out of Bethlehem. And some of you right now know that there are folk who looked at your life and they said you're insignificant. Your daddy was a drunk. Your mother was a drug addict and you are in the place called Bethel. Nothing good is going to come from you. You'll never be in, you'll never be in a good marriage because you're a product of divorce. You ain't never going to be nothing. Your daddy was nothing. Your mama was nothing. You was born in the projects, born in the ghetto. You in Bethel. But God knows how to bring greatness out of the place called Bethel. God knows how to look at insignificance and bring something great. You might say I'm Bethel, but one day I'm going to be in Jerusalem. One day I'm going to be more than what I am now because God knows how to bring greatness out of Bethlehem. Are y'all following what I'm saying this morning? There are some people who have looked at your history. And says, you ain't going nowhere and you ain't going nowhere fast. People have judged you based on your beginning. You're a product of divorce. You ain't never going to have no good marriage. You, are a, you, you were raised in a single parent home. You ain't never going to be no good daddy or mama. There are folk who have already come to conclusions about you. But you need to look them square in the eye and say, yeah, I'm Bethel, but soon I'll be in Jerusalem. I wish I had I wish I had some church up in here. We got some folk too sophisticated this morning. I've come to talk to somebody who knows what it is to be talked about. I've come to talk to somebody who's been disregarded. I've come to talk to somebody that think nothing great's gonna come from you. You need to say, yes, I'm Bethlehem, but my Savior was born in Bethlehem. Yes, I'm Bethlehem, but great things came out of that city. I am in that place called Bethlehem, but one day... God's going to make this kid a king. And he found me in Bethlehem. Understand, church, I don't care what your beginnings were. And I guess this is only for folk who have had some rough times in their beginning. I, this might not be for everybody. This is, this is for folk that had to get raised in a house with 10 brothers and sisters and you didn't know where your next meal was coming from. This, this is folk whose parents got a bad reputation and daddy is a pimp and mama ain't a nobody. This is folk that looked at you and said you ain't never gonna have no education because nobody in your family ever graduated. These are, I'm talking to some folk now who know what it is for folk to just completely disregard them and say ain't nothing gonna come good out of your life. You need to say, that's all right. I can't, I'm maybe not where I need to be, but I've come a mighty long way. You need to look at where I am now. Back then they didn't want me, but now I'm hot. They... But you got to know that God's trying to take me somewhere. And when folk have completely come to the conclusion that there's no greatness in you, you need to have a mindset. That God can bring greatness out of Bethlehem. 
Are y'all following what I, and this is for my young people too. And I, a lot of this has to do with my young folk because there's a lot of young people in here who people have come to those conclusions about you. I don't have time. Hey, well, let me hurry up. Let me hear some of y'all looking at me like, Brother Hayward, I wish he was preaching something else. So this, this may not be for you. That's all right. That's all right. That's no problem. That's no problem. That's no problem. Let me, let me, let me hurry up along in here. This was good when I looked at it. I'll tell you what. This was good. God said, I saw my king before he became a king. <laughs> God said, my king is coming out of Bethlehem. I'm going to get him out of a place of insignificance. But in Samuel, when he gets to Bethlehem, he gets there and he invites Jesse and his boys to the sacrifice. And obviously a conversation has transpired where Jesse now understands one of his boys is going to be anointed king. So the first boy shows up and his name is Eli Ab, and he looks good. Jesse looked at him and said, I mean, rather, excuse me, Samuel looked at him. And Samuel said, surely, this is God's anointing. He looks the part. Oh, God, I looked on his countenance and he looks regal. He looks royal. He's tall and big in stature. He looks like a person to be feared. And God said, you're looking on the wrong standard. I don't judge man. Based on his outward appearance. But when I look at a man, I see beyond the outward. And, and I don't look at how he's dressing. And I don't look at his countenance. What I look at is his inward passion. And I look at the intents of his heart. I've come today to tell you, your greatness is attached to the condition of your heart. See, see some, 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 some of y'all are going to miss this this morning. You're going to miss it. You're going to miss the blessing. God doesn't bless you. On the basis of your outward appearance. But when God opens doors, God has a man in favor on the basis of the condition of his heart. God, God can look at David and he's going to get to David. But when David becomes king, the description of David is he is a man. choosing a man based on how he looks. And some of us in the church have not learned that you got to be careful about the looks. Some of y'all in bad relationships because all you looked at. All you saw was what you saw. And you ain't never going to get somebody good in your life if all you look at is the outward appearance. God said, I don't look at it that way. What I do is look at his heart. Let me tell you something. Only God can perfectly judge the intent of a man's heart. Now, you can get implications of what's in a man's heart by looking at the demonstration of his character. But even that is not the complete sure shot. Yeah. To only God knows completely what is in a man's heart. Yeah. And in the church, we have to stop placing value on people based on how they look. And we cannot devalue people based on how they look. Some of us have come to conclusions about people because all we see is what we see when a woman comes in here with a mini skirt on and is provocative she don't know jesus but she walked up in here some of us will already conclude that god can't do nothing with her but i've come today to tell you that God can take a prostitute and make her a preacher's wife. 
God can take a woman that's in the streets and God can make her a virtuous woman. We've got to stop coming to conclusions on the basis of where people are. Ah, y'all awake now. Mm, she ain't never gonna be nothing. Look at how she dressed. Well, how did you used to dress? Y'all better help. Don't y'all act like y'all don't know. You better act like you know somebody up in here. Like you always been modest. Folk need time to change. When folk come out the water, they don't come up automatically virtuous. Some of you went down cussing and you... So I start running up in here. Now let me say this because sometimes you gotta you gotta buffer stuff. I ain't telling you you gotta stay immodest. And some of you women have to learn that you must go through a process of development. And it cannot always be about your shape and your size. At some point you gotta cover that up and let folks see what's on the inside. You gotta be careful because if that's what you put out, you better be careful about what you attract. You're going to dress promiscuous and then tell a guy, he shouldn't be looking at me like that. Well, you on display. Uh, let me come off off that, boy. Y'all all right? I ain't telling you don't look good. You ought to look good. I pride myself on looking good. You ought to look good. What I'm saying is have some taste. Look like you love God. I'll tell you what an older preacher told me. I'm going to put it on the older preacher so that when I say it, you know an older preacher said it. He said, the length of your skirt will determine the length of your faith. <laughs> show me a woman with a short skirt and I'll show you the length and depth of her faith. I'll show you how mature she really is in Christ Jesus. Show me how she dress. All right, I'm off that. Jay-Z said, we off that. We off that. We off that. Young folk know what I'm, we off that. We off that. We off that. But I'm saying to you, you got to be careful about how you judge. The value or the lack of value in people. David was considered a man after God's own heart. Now, y'all ready? Can I go a little deeper than that? Just to show you, only God knows the intent of a man's heart. David was an adulteress. But the New Testament describes him as a man after God's own heart. And if he was in the church today, some of us would have said his ministry's finished. Ah, some of us would have said there ain't nothing left for you to do in the kingdom of God. You might as well hang it up. Go find a job at McDonald's. Don't you minister to nobody else because you ain't worth nothing. But that's not what God told David. That's not how God viewed David. God said, I know you messed up and I'm going to put a consequence on you. But after you go through what you got to go through, get up and keep ruling in your kingdom. Ah, uh, see, some of y'all don't like that. Some of y'all keep your arms folded on that one, praise God. But I'm going to come to tell you, I'm coming there to tell you. And, and I'm tired, and I'm getting this more and more as I go through my ministry in the last few days. I'm getting this more and more. So many people wonder, Brother Hayward, why do you use certain people? So don't you know their history? Yeah, I know their history. But I also know God ain't finished with them yet. And I refuse to throw folk to the dogs and act like they ain't got no more value because you got a bunch of self-righteous and people that want to talk about what you did and where you've been and act like they ain't never done nothing. But I come to their day, you, God is not finished with some folk. When you count them out, God counts them in. God says that man still got some value and I'm not going to sit here and, and, and appease people's opinions. Not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Amen. 
And it just just a few days, not even a few days ago, the 24-hour period. Oh, 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 why, 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 what's this about? I mean, what this is about? You ain't God. You ain't even in a position to ask me what this is about. Is the man still in sin? Are you his judge? And we got so many folk that don't believe in restoring, they believe in rejecting. There is no doctrine of restoration, some folk. We got folk that if you fall, you might as well hang it up. Oh, I, I saw one of the eldest kids and, and one of them messed up. So, what? They are kids. Having children don't mean they'll be sinless. We got folk that are just so self-righteous. Don't you remember in the Old Testament that Israel could not keep the law perfectly? That's why we got grace. That's why we got mercy. And we are some of the most merciless people. Acting like you ain't done nothing when you just ain't got caught. On to the next level. Oh, we off that. We off that. We off that. We off that. Watch how you judge people's value, church. You don't know what God's going to do with somebody. And when, and when, and when Samuel saw Eliab, he said, yeah, that's him. And God said, no, that's not him. First of all, that ain't the king that I saw. <laughs> mm, what does that mean? Watch this, church. Y'all ready? You ready? All right. Y y you'll miss your blessing in this lesson. Don't miss it. God's got your name on some blessings that is for you. Nobody can, nobody can take it. But you can forfeit your blessing when you don't have a heart that's after God. Okay? Don't, don't, don't miss that. That's big. That's big. When, you're, when the condition of your heart becomes so callous that it's no longer chasing God, God... Or rather, you can forfeit your own blessing. That's what happened to Saul. God told Saul, I'm rejecting you. And then he tells Saul, this is 1 Samuel 13, 14. He tells Saul then, not only am I rejecting you, but I sought a king after my own heart. What's the implication? Saul's heart was no longer with God. David sins. And you remember David sang with Bathsheba. You remember that? And you remember what he did. You remember the story. And then God punishes him. But when David got convicted by Nathan, I believe it was, when he got convicted, you saw sorrow fall on David. A different response than Saul. When Saul was being rejected, it wasn't about God, the sorrow for Saul. Saul was just worried about losing power. But David was concerned about his heart. The reason I know is because when David got out of line with God, he understood the value of having a heart after God's heart because when he wrote Psalms 51, he said, Create in me! A clean heart. I've got to get my heart back in line with God or I will forfeit my blessing. And I know that's what he was thinking about because when you read Psalms 51, he says, don't take away your Holy Spirit. He said, I'm not worried about prominence. I'm not worried about popularity. I'm not worried about what folk think. Right now, God is about what you think. Create me. Clean heart. And if you ain't careful, you'll forfeit your blessings. <laughs> Not because somebody can take your blessing, but because your heart ain't in line with God. We'll move on. Uh, listen to me. Listen to me. He makes seven boys pass by. Seven. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Aminadab. Eliab. And God redundantly said, Not him. Not him. Not him. And then he said, Jesse, do you uh, have any other sons? 
Because after he made his boys pass, Jesse never brought David up. Okay. Those of you taking notes. Samuel had the wrong standard. Jesse just disregarded it. But in all of it, it don't change that he going to become king. It doesn't matter who judges you. Doesn't matter who disregards you. When God says that's your blessing, it don't make no difference who don't think you are, or it doesn't make any difference who thinks you don't deserve it. You got any more sons? Yeah, I got one. He, but he's the youngest. Come on, preach out. Are they out there keeping sheep? I'm, is that who you are? I didn't bring him up for a reason. I just didn't think he was part of the lineup. There's some folk that think you're part of the lineup when it comes to being blessed, when it comes to reaching your destination and reaching your goal. Some people have completely disregarded that you'll ever be anything in your life. And if you let that stuff get in your spirit, I'm telling you, you'll give in. I've seen a lot of people give up on life, their goals, and their dreams because of what folks said about it. Now, I'm not familiar with keeping sheep, but I know about folk talking about you, the youngest. I know all about that. I was, I, I had uh, applied to a church in, in, in Long Island, and I did a gospel meeting for that church, and I, I put in my application, it was, uh, Pop said, time you get a job, boy, you're about to marry my daughter. So, there ain't no sense you sticking around here, you, you need a job, you, you know, you need to preach, it's time for you to lead the nest. And so, uh, I ain't had no money, it's time for me to get myself together and say, all right, God has put some stuff in me, it's time for me to put it to work. I made an application, uh, sent an application to a church, looking for a minister, priest for the church, eight baptisms, more baptisms than they baptized in a whole year. Come on, they, they was, you know, and they said, wow, this boy is an awesome preacher. He, my goodness, he has really done a fine job. Man, we ain't never seen uh, these kind of responses. They just all, and they said, well, what are we going to do? They said, well, he's too young. Uh, so we're going to have to just let him go. He, really, his, his application is, uh, doesn't weigh as much because he don't have no experience. Okay. Now, years have lapsed. Years have gone by. They've been through two preachers. Can't keep one. And then, then they call me and some of the members call me and some of the leadership call me and say, Orpheus, we are so sorry because we know what you're doing out there in Atlanta, Georgia. We see uh, what you're capable of and I just wish we would have jumped on it at the time. But we, we just want to apologize to you because we, we couldn't see. Right? I said, don't worry about it. Just make sure you start getting a better standard and stop discounting people based on the wrong standard and maybe God will bless you with a good preacher. But as for me, I ain't coming to Long Island. I'm happy where I am. God is blessing me with what I'm doing and it's too late now. I'm already doing what God wants me to do. As a matter of fact, what I've realized is God just didn't have my name on that blessing. God had my name in Atlanta, Georgia. And God And so you don't fall out and get upset when you don't get what you think you should have. It just might mean God didn't put your name there. So I ain't got to worry about what I don't get. God's going to make me get what I need to get if my heart is in line with Him. And I told them, you better make sure you start looking not just on the outward, but start judging people for the right reason and get the right standard. Because as for me, yet back then you did want me, but now I'm hot. Oh. Didn't want me back then, I understand. Now I'm hot, you all on me. Mm, praise God, too late. I'm on to the next now. On to the next, on to the next, on, on to the next. Ha ha! 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 On to the next, baby. So understand that you don't fall out over that kind of stuff. You didn't get that job, not a problem. God got your name somewhere else. <laughs> Are y'all following what I'm saying? Oh, they didn't hire me. Oh, they lost their blessing. Praise God. God's got my name somewhere else. Watch this. Last point. The sermon's over. Watch this now. Don't miss it because if you miss this, you miss the big point. Listen. All this time, while they are coming to their conclusions about David, Jesse said he's the youngest. He's key. He out there keeping sheep. David is keeping sheep, but God is destined him to be a king. 
He's doing something that seems to be completely unrelated to what God has called him to be. Are y'all seeing me so far? God's called him to be a king, but God is allowing him to keep sheep. Now, he will not stay at the level of keeping sheep. But God is allowing him at this stage to keep sheep. But this is not the final destination. And what we've got to learn in the church is sometimes you must learn the value of your present state. Sometimes we're so caught up in where we want to go that we miss what God's trying to teach in the stage of keeping sheep. Why is he keeping sheep? There are certain skill sets David's going to learn in the process of keeping sheep. And God let him be there because God wants not just a king, but a shepherd. Some of y'all going to miss this. And what David's got to learn at that stage is how to be a shepherd. Because God doesn't want an authoritarian to be king. He got that in Saul. What he wants now is a shepherd king that knows how to care and protect his sheep. So God said, learn something at the stage of keeping sheep. That's not where you'll stay, but learn the value of your present state. Next thing, flip the coin. But don't get comfortable there. Because that ain't the final destination. And there are some folk in life who became satisfied with where they are. And they have missed the opportunity that was placed in them when God gave them potential. Let me just suggest, God has given you some skill sets and some of your experiences that really has set you up to own your own business. It has set you up to elevate in different areas of life. But because you don't see the value of that present state, what happens is you let all kind of opportunities pass you by. Because you became satisfied with keeping sheep. And then we quote scriptures like, in whatever state I'm in, I've learned to be content. That verse ain't talking about be satisfied with where you are. It means wherever I am, God provides. That's the context of that passage. Just read the passage and you see it's talking about provision. That means no matter where I am in life, whether I'm poor, rich, because Paul says, if I abound, I'm content. If I don't, I'm content. Because he knew from which came his source of strength. Are y'all following me? But in life, you cannot become so content in the sense of settling. There's a difference between contentment and settling. Some people settle. You, you could have your own business. Y'all yeah, don't like that? I know y'all don't all like nine to fives, do you? Okay, praise the mighty name of Jesus. Y'all love it. Sometimes you got to know you got some skill sets that can bless you. And you got to know, you learn that stuff in the stage of keeping sheep. But God is saying, I want you to be king. And what you have done, and, and people do it in the church all the time. You are a child of God. God has put some gifts in you, some intelligence. He's allowed some of y'all to be academic. He's allowed you to develop some skills. And what you've done is you have just come to a point in life where you said, I ain't going to make no more progress. Just going to keep sheep. God says, wait, I got something better for you. And I want you to keep me at the center of your life because when I bring you there, I want you to serve me. But we say, no, no, no. Stay where I am. 
and just settle for mediocrity. And there's some of you in here right now who don't realize God got your name on a blessing. And it's not that somebody going to take it, you just ain't going to receive it. And not only are you not going to receive it, some of you are going to forfeit it because your heart's going to be somewhere else. 